video you're about to watch is a production from our ministry. Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast. We broadcast every Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time here on YouTube. Uh, and we have different pastors, teachers from different churches and denominations coming on the show to d- discuss a wide range of theological topics. Many of our guests we agree with and many of our de- guests we disagree with. But our goal is to understand God's word so that we can then understand the God who has given us his word. Uh, so we hope that you enjoy this conversation. We hope it's been a benefit to you. Uh, if you do enjoy this video and want to continue to help us produce content like this, we'd ask that you go down into the description of the video and donate. There's a, a description link there in the video, and it would help us continue producing content just like this. Be blessed. Daily bread. Oh, wicked hunger. Amen. Hey, everybody. This is Joshua Lewis with Remnant Radio. I do it every single time. I have to go back in and cut these out. Uh, we're talking about today about contemplative prayer. I'm in studio with Matthew Esquivel and Michael Roundtree. Before we have Matthew introduce himself, I'm going to have uh, Michael sit, shout out. And how, How's Corona? How's coronavirus treating you? <laughs> corona? How is Corona itself? How's, how's it treating Not you? Not so great. But, uh, you know, we're just still adjusting. Same old, same old. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I don't have your graphic in, but I do have the link in. Perfect. I just realized it just now. I was like, don't call for the graphic. That's all right. All right. Tell us about yourself and your ministry, Matthew. (laughs) Okay. So I'm Matthew Esquivel. I am an associate pastor at the Dallas House of Prayer, working on my doctorate right now at Southern Methodist University. And um, anyway, I am associate pastor there, but also direct our Encounter Jesus School, which Josh has a link for um, in the comments. I don't know where to find that, but in the video description, that one. So that starts this summer. More about that later. But um, anyway, yeah. Excellent. So oh. the technical, the sound in the background kind of. I know. Like, I hear myself off. talking. Yeah, so. no worries. You can you can hit the mute button on the on the keyboard there, crew, and that will actually mute the headphones on the keyboard. Anyway, uh, so what we're talking about today is contemplative prayer. Uh, like Matthew just said, he is a pastor at Storehouse Church in Dallas. Uh, they're starting an Encounter Jesus School here. Is it next semester? Is it next oh, June oh, one? June first. June one. Yeah, so yeah, June first. Yeah. If you guys are interested and you're living in the Dallas metroplex, if what Matthew's saying today is like really resonates with you and you want to learn more about that, that'd be a great place to plug in. You can check that out in the video description here uh, on the video. So we also, before we get too far into it, because I always do this at the end and it really needs to happen up front, uh, Dawson does a lot of research for the ministry here, and he put a great reading plan together for you for recommended reading out of certain excerpts of of books uh, from some of the people that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, And he also gave kind of a study guide of terms and how they're used throughout history, those kinds of things that we would advise both of you we would advise that you read both of those, not both of you, because more than two people are watching at this moment. So, uh, uh, Matthew, uh, tell us a little about contemplative prayer, and we'll just kind of dive into the subject. Define it for us. Or where does it come from? From whence does it hail? And uh, and m- maybe define. Yeah, let's let's just start there. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I'd actually like to back up just a, a couple of steps, and just on my introduction sure. to contemplative prayer, uh-huh. um, and then I'll kind of go in and define some terms there. But. Um, Without giving my whole story, I started going into ministry in 2008, raising support to go into full-time campus ministry. I was the intercessory prayer guy there. Um, I was learning from the uh, 60-year-old intercessor ladies at my church in high school about prayer from that. So I always looked for the 60-year-olds that loved how to pray (laughs) and that loved to pray um, as kind of my prayer guides, if you will. But um, anyway, as I'm going into into full-time ministry, like the Lord is just had been working on so much in my heart. I went through a lot of inner healing, a lot of deliverance over that past year and a half, and I'm just feeling very unqualified for ministry. But there's simultaneously, there's this hunger for God starting to stir in me, and I'm going to this retreat down in Austin where actually my the ministry I was a part of, I was leading, helping lead it. And so we had about 100 college students down in Austin and then one of our guest speakers happened to be Tracy Eckert, who is our senior pastor. Um, she and her husband, John, founded the storehouse, Dallas, Dallas House of Prayer. And she's speaking there about prayer. And there was something that when she was talking that really gripped my heart. And I remember writing down in my journal just a last, the last few words of the prayer of Paul in Ephesians three sixteen through 20. We're saying that you may be strengthened with power through his spirit in your, in your inner man, that you may, Christ may dwell in your heart through faith to know his love that surpasses knowledge. And this last phrase, that you might be filled up with all the fullness of God. 
And I wrote down, after she talked, my heart was gripped, and I wrote down that phrase, fullness of God. And I said, God, this is what I want. And so I started getting involved at the Dallas House of Prayer, where at that time it was in John and Tracy's living room, and they just put on the same CDs in an old 16 or a six CD changer uh, device, whatever they call them now. <laughs> you know, we didn't have a didn't have a, <laughs> a Spotify CD then. Record you know, player. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> same CDs every Saturday from nine to noon, and I just go and sit in their little side living room, and I just was like, Lord, teach me how to pray because I know that she has something that I want, and I know there's an invitation here, and. I know that prayer is deeply connected to it. Um, so I just go and sit and just kind of figure out what it's like to be with God in this deep, intimate way. Um, so um, I started listening as well to some teaching on the Song of Solomon by a guy named Gary Weens. He was connected with the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, started his own House of Prayer, um, IHOP Northwest in Washington State. And as I listened to these teachings on the Song of Solomon, my heart was just awakened to know the love of Jesus. And so this this Ephesians 3 prayer, I mean, it's one of my favorite prayers in the whole Bible. I want to know the width, the length, the depth, and the height of your love. And I just started to listen to him talk about the Song of Songs as Christ and the bridegroom, or Christ as the bridegroom and his church as the bride, and this invitation into intimate authority. Um, and so that really drew my heart into prayer got involved in IHOP, went to the One Thing Conference, and just got gripped for this One Thing Desire. It's a Psalm 27.4, which if you're saying, what is contemplative prayer? What word in the Bible is it talk about contemplative prayer? Psalm 27.4, I think, is the key verse. One thing have I desired of the Lord, one thing I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing at your beauty and inquiring in your temple. That is the heart of of contemplative prayer. Um, so I started getting drawn into this, started spending more time with the Lord. God, how much can I give you? Um, at the same time, as I was learning how to pray in this way, it was very striving-based, very works-based. If I and, 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 and I believe in fasting and prayer. Um, um, I believe that fasting and prayer helps position you to encounter the Lord, but I was doing a lot of it to try to feel like I I can earn something from God, mm -hmm. and then I'm 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 gonna like twist his arm into an encounter, perhaps, and or just like Lord, I'm just trying to love you, and I'm 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 failing at my desire to pray and fast as much as I think I should, oh. um, and so that was going on, and just getting heaped with condemnation, um, with with um, with 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 sin struggle. Um, I'll just be vulnerable here, just just sexual sin um, that. Uh, that uh, had recently happened, and um, and I just was like, Lord, I need, I really want to know you in the way that your word says I can, that I can dwell, in, that I can gaze at your beauty, that I can know the love of Christ in this way. Um, and so I went to the house of prayer, the living room, <laughs> side living room, and I just sat in this chair and listening to worship music, and the Lord started to encounter me. Um, I started seeing I started seeing a vision, which I won't go into details of that, but then there came a point where I actually could not move very much. Mm -hmm. um, and there was actually a woman in the room sitting next to me that thought she looked over at me and just saw me and tried to get my attention a couple of times, and she was a nurse, and she actually thought I was going into a seizure. Hmm. And so they tried to, they carried me like comatose, like eyes rolled back kind of deal. It, somewhat of a comatose state. But you um, were conscious. But I was conscious. Um, I, she, she asked me a couple of questions and I didn't, I remember vaguely hearing her ask me one time for a piece of paper. So you entered in, then, you were in kind of like maybe a trance. Yes. I okay. was in a trance. He knows whether or mm -hmm. not he was awake or sleeping. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he doesn't know yeah. if he was yeah. in the body or out of right. the body. I went to a trance. First time I've ever experienced this. Sure. So um, next thing I know, she's shaking me and saying, Matthew, Matthew, you're go you're having a seizure. Um, and it, it kind of freaks me out because I never experienced this. Right. So I got really scared. Um, and so we were, I was trying to walk out to the living room, but I couldn't get up and I couldn't move. Um, I had to be carried out, and once they started carrying me into the, to the bigger living room, I started uh, shaking, trembling, and I, I 
was being felt like I was jerked out of this what I thought was an encounter with the Lord, but that someone is telling me is a seizure and telling me I need to get a new pair of pants because I probably soiled myself. Um, this is what? this is yeah, this is intense. This is 2009. For, for okay. clarity, yes, did, did you? Not, I, did not, okay, I did not. I did not soil my. It's important, it's important to the Praise story. God. For those yeah. who are hearing and going, yeah. that sounds demonic. No. It, we didn't yeah. go that no, 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 far. No. There was no okay. soil. Yeah. No, okay. no soil. I'd like to clarify some of that. In a yeah. sec, but I want right. to hear the rest of the story. Hey, yes. And for the record, a little biblical allusion here. I'm kind of thinking about Hannah, where Eli's like, you know, you're trashed Stamming out of lips. your mind. And she's like, I'm praying. And sometimes yeah. people. And, and then, of course, you have Acts chapter 2. Yeah. Uh, you know, these men are not drunk. So the idea that somebody could be having such a spiritual experience experience that observers are like something bad's going on it, it is within the biblical framework okay right so keep on going thank you yes um so they take me into the living room a few people are surrounding me i'm kind of like coming back into consciousness and um and scared and actually very emotional i actually start crying and this is not like i actually don't like talking about this very much because they're very personal but sure. um um but there's an invitation here from the Lord. And um, and they were about to take me to the ambulance um, uh, and take me to the hospital. Um, but uh, they got, uh, Tracy Eckert comes by and uh, calls my mom. And my mom, you know, my mom is not like a suit, was, especially at that time. She's part of a charismatic church now, but was not like in the, we grew up Episcopal. And so um, very liturgical, very, and right. the way we worship. So, they tell her what's going on and are asking her, should we take him to the hospital? And she just said, you know, Matthew's never had a seizure. I think he's just having a spiritual experience. <laughs> so my mom literally saved the day. If it weren't for my mother on wow. that phone, I would have been rushed to the hospital. Um, so they take me into a back room and Tracy sits down with me and she just says, you know what? People like Heidi Baker, they were out for seven days straight. Yeah. She says, I think the Lord was encountering you. And so she prayed over me. She and John were in the room and maybe a couple of other people. And um, and I went right back into the experience after she got done praying mm. with me. Mm. And um, there was some stuff I saw, but more what I heard, more what I felt. The best way I can describe it was I felt like my heart had been taken up and inserted into the heart of Jesus mm. and just left there. Um and that Jesus had somehow taken his heart and come and just put his heart in mine mm -hmm. and just left me in this state for about an hour um, was the duration of the experience. And then it just kind of these, the after glow of it lasted for about the next, the rest of the day. Um, so that experience, the reason I share that is because that's what really launched me to say into this, there is another realm of experiencing God that I've not been exposed to before. Um, and um, so it got me searching out. I, and, and I started having a few more of these experiences. The, the most frequent, the, the highest frequency of them happened in the years 2009 to 2011, and then in 2013 to 2014. That was like a spike year. Um, and then there was just some, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like every day, every month, every, it was, there was, there was quite a gap between them, but those seasons were periods of more closer contractions, if you will. Heightened, heightened, <laughs> yeah. uh, con, uh, heightened, uh, encounters, level of encounters. I mean, I've had similar experiences. I mean, mm -hmm. as you're describing them, right. uh, almost identical, it wasn't public. I was with my wife. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and we, I think we talked about this maybe in, the slain in the spirit episode that we did, which I think if you're listening to this conversation and you're going, these experiences sound foreign to me, go watch that episode. It might make light of some of this, uh, maybe illuminate some of this. We talked about a couple of things. You said trans, you said paralysis and trembling. It's yeah. so like run through those for the heretic hunters that might be watching just to really quickly get them out of the way. Right, right, we right. don't have to make the, the whole show about that. But okay. uh, when they start talk about paralysis, they talk about people who've done occult stuff, they've done... Um, uh, I mean, also, I admit I've had this experience, so I'm not like trying to put you on a spot. No, like, absolutely. We can, we, can, we can, you know, chat with it. But uh, as far as paralysis goes, um, especially when people do UFOs and uh, they get into occult stuff in, in demonology and they all 
the, the constant experience for people who get involved with the cult is that an alien comes and visits them and they're paralyzed, right? right. They're having this open vision while they're paralyzed, right. which sounds very similar to a lot of the charismatic experiences that we've, we, I've had, you've had, many of right. you have had. Um, talk about trembling and trances. I, explain some of these things to us, to those who list, who hear it and they say, that sounds cultish. Right. That doesn't sound... I've been a Christian for a very long time. That doesn't sound like my experience or the experience of those who are around me. Right. I don't want to say it doesn't sound Christian because you flip through the pages of the Bible, there's some weird stuff in there. Okay, right, so, right. Uh, uh, it, it's certainly I think within the realm of biblical, but it might not be our flavor of Christianity that we're aware of. Right. So maybe maybe walk us through some of that real quick. Definitely. Well, the devil likes to counterfeit the sure. work of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Acts chapter two, he will pour out his spirit on all flesh, visions, dreams, prophecy. Mm -hmm. And so within, within the New Testament, you see this happen in the book of Acts. You see it happen to Peter, and you see it happen to Paul. Peter is about to have lunch, and he, it says he falls into a trance, and then he sees... Pigs in a blanket. He sees the pigs in a blanket. He That's sees right. lunch, you know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and it's all these animals that Jews aren't allowed to eat. But, um, and then Paul... And so that just kind of happened with, I mean, lunchtime. This was yeah. not him praying and trying to cultivate this encounter. This was him just waiting for lunch. Paul, it says later in the book of Acts, that he went to the temple to pray and that he started, he went into a trance as well. And so that language is used. And what is that? Um, um, we also see the prophet Daniel, that when he mm -hmm. would encounter, when he would have these visions or encounters with angels, that sometimes he was trembling, felt sick, didn't know what to do. John, in Revelation chapter 1, sees the risen Christ, falls over as a dead man, and it takes Jesus touching him in order to strengthen his body in order to be able to stand. Similar experience of the transfiguration. Jesus, while he's praying, starts shining and glowing, and Peter, James, and John are freaking out and don't know what to do. And so just these, you, you've got a number of experiences like that in the Bible where the, the power of God can come in a way that actually suspends our human faculties. Um, and we saw this again in when Solomon was dedicating the temple, um, that they, he prayed a prayer and they began to sing um, worship to the Lord and that the, the glory of the Lord showed up and the priests were unable to minister in the temple. Mm -hmm. So we see a number of biblical examples. I mean, you read through Samuel, through Kings, you read through the prophets, they've had similar experiences like this. Mm -hmm. And so what the devil does is he will imitate and he will counterfeit these things. Mm -hmm. And two ways he tries to trip up the church is, one, to start developing an unhealthy attachment to and fascination with these types of experiences that actually distract people from just knowing Jesus. That's good. And so yeah. we're going we're gonna to hit more on that in a little bit. Another way he wants to uh, deceive the church is to get them so scared of what they see with the demonic that they completely dismiss biblical experiences mm -hmm. that God is using today and that ha he has been using, as we'll talk about briefly, throughout church history as a way to commune and to communicate mm -hmm. with his people. Yeah, I like what you said about how the devil has his counterfeits, and uh, Jonathan Edwards dealt with a lot of this during the Great Absolutely. Awakening, and, mm -hmm. and he came out with this treatise, because he was getting accused of you know, being like all about manifestations and craziness and the enthusiast, yes, like a, the exactly. enthusiasm. John Wesley, and, the same. Yeah. yeah. And he had this, uh, this treatise called the, I think it was called the distinguishing marks of a work of the Holy spirit. Yes. And what he goes through is, is he's, you know, he's like, basically there are some fakers and there are some legitimate and on the surface, you actually can't always tell because, <laughs> you know, they'll be, you know, doing their thing on the ground, laid out, having visions or whatever. Carpet time. And and Carpet time. <laughs> exactly. But at the end of the day, what he says is the way you know. I mean, he basically is like, Jesus' wisdom is justified by your children. Basically, look at the fruit of it. And he's like, you know, one man falls out, has has all these visions, has this experience. And before that, he was a deadbeat drunkard who's beaten his wife. And, and then the next day, he's completely transformed. Then another person, same situation, still beating his wife. And it's like, well, we know which one was real. Absolutely. So, so have you experienced like a real life change as a, as a result of this experience? How would you describe transformation in your own heart and life? Right, it's especially right after. And I, I look back on that experience, and every time I think about it, it's like just the memory of it makes me want Jesus more. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember after that, um, Pornography temptation did not even come at all for about a year after that. 
I mean, just really left so a completely. very practical, very practical, righteous fruit. That exactly came from the it. desire for it. I remember walking to that my doesn't sound like the devil to me. <laughs> I remember walking home to my apartment that that week, um, and this is maybe a little graphic, but I could hear people having sex, like neighbors, you know, sure. outside. I'm just on the sidewalk. I'm like, I'm like, wow, okay. But my heart, you know. At the moment, like I laugh now, but at the moment, like my heart was truly grieved. And I was just like, Jesus, please just show them that there's so much more. And I, I would break down crying at the at the at the dinner table. My roommates did not know what to do with me because I was just like, I this this tenderness of love for the Lord. Mm-hmm. And um what a number of contemplatives will talk about, I had I didn't have the language for this at the time, is called the gift of tears. Mm-hmm. And it's it's tears of repentance, it's tears of conviction of sin, mm-hmm. and it's tears of longing for God. Mm-hmm. Um, so you mentioned it just here, and maybe this is a good way to kind of transition into our conversation on contemplative prayer. Yes. Um, but it's do all of these people that we're talking about today, um, uh, are, are they going to have these kind of catalytic experiences that cause them to realize the beauty of God in a kind of experiential way? The Psalm 63 saw you in the sanctuary, I behold you, the power in the sanctuary, yes. holding your power and glory in your steadfast love is better than life. Like this yes. idea of just dwelling, abiding, hanging out with was initiated by an experience. Is that? I would say for Teresa of Avila, definitely. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about her. John of the Cross, he did have a number of these experiences. A lot of people did. I mean, there was a whole, we'll, we'll get into all that, but that's that's what drew me to these folks. Mm-hmm. And so I started reading, and I, I, I started reading some things on prayer, uh, on contemplative prayer, Madame Jeanne Guyon, um, Experiencing the Depths of Jesus Christ. Um, but when I, I came across Teresa of Avila and John on the Cross, two, 16th century, a nun and a monk, um, nun and a friar, and... When I started reading, I came upon her book, Interior Castle, and his book, Living Flame of Love. And I just would weep, and I still weep when I read these books, because I finally found someone that was giving language to these things. Mm. And that were having these kinds of experiences, and were, were you read Teresa of Avila and her, her autobiography. I mean, I imagine this scared 20-something-year-old girl that had, didn't know what to do with this, most of their uh, her spiritual advisors that she was going to thought she was faking it. Mm-hmm. And it, that she finally started getting spiritual advisors that had had these kind of experiences before and knew how to lead her mm-hmm. in this. And John of the Cross was was one of those as well, um, even though he was much younger than she. Um, but um, they had these experiences, and she describes in her autobiography, in her uh, spiritual news, she describes these in great detail. Um, and what the Lord's doing in them, mm-hmm. and how that drew them into greater prayer, produced deeper humility, mm-hmm. but even some things that kind of scared them when they started experiencing mm-hmm. these things. And what God, what is this? What do I do with this? And why does nobody believe me when I tell them? So, yeah. okay, now uh, let's talk about. So we've got the experience, mm-hmm. and we've got contemplative prayer. And I think some would say, well, these aren't necessarily the same thing. Have we even defined contemplative prayer? Right. So that's where I want to get to. <laughs> oh, there you go. Right, right, right. Because, because like, I think somebody might say, well, okay, yes, you can point to some amazing spiritual experiences in the Bible, right. but were the people ministering in the temple contemplatively praying? Or, you know, Peter was praying, but was he contemplatively praying? Right. And, and so help us understand just exactly what you mean by okay. contemplative prayer, and Definitely. maybe... Uh, to whatever degree possible, maybe looking into uh, some scripture verses f- that that point you to that. Absolutely, I think uh, Thomas Dubai in his book Fire Within, I've got that here. Um, great book about John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila and their life of prayer and contemplation. Um, kind of pulling from these sources, he he describes it as such: as contemplation or contemplative prayer is at its base level and its heart a deep love communion with the triune God. Mm-hmm. He goes on to say, by depth here we mean a knowing, loving, a knowing, loving that we cannot produce but only receive. It is not merely a mentally expressed, I love you. It is a wordless awareness and love that we ourselves cannot initiate or prolong. Okay, that's Thomas Dubai. John of the Cross, and this is just a summary from his own writings that's uh, in his collected works, 
of John of the Cross here. Um, he describes it as a communication of God that's not tied to the senses. So we've got our physical senses here, mm-hmm. um, but there's something deeper within that the way that God is, his, his spirit is communicating to us, and there is this, he describes it as this loving awareness of God, mm-hmm. of his presence. Um, and the, the important, what might help it a little bit um, is to distinguish it from meditative prayer. Hmm. So, so it's different. It, it is different. A lot of times, especially in the 20, 21st century, those terms are used very interchangeably. Um, these folks use them very differently. Meditative prayer for these, for Teresa and John, are it, it's, it's something that actively involves your mind, your intentions. And so an example would be I'm going to open up and read through what well, we're in Holy Week here, the Stations of the Cross. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to read through a passage about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's arrested. Mm-hmm. And I may me- I may read over that. I might read it over two or three times. Think about it. Think about being there with Jesus in the Garden, filling your mind with all those filling images. Filling your mind yeah. with all those images. Exactly. Getting your getting your inner senses, your your um, right. um, um, attuned to that scene. Um, it could be reading the Psalms in a very deeply personal way. Mm-hmm. It's, I'm going to read through this Psalm, but not just to read it. I'm a meditative prayer. Is, there's a phrase that's going to stand out to me, and I'm going to, I'm going to camp on this phrase, that Psalm 27, 4, I'm reading it, one thing I desire mm-hmm. and I shall seek. And I'm intentionally picking that Psalm and praying it out to the Lord. God, I desire this one thing, to gaze at your beauty, to inquire in your temple, to behold you, Jesus. <sighs> That's meditative prayer. I want to have a prayer meeting with you. <laughs> <laughs> I just think we already are. I think I just had a train. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> it can happen like that. Yeah. If I look like I'm having a seizure, just let me go. Yeah. <laughs> right. So those are a couple of examples of meditative prayer. I'm actively engaged in this prayer. Contemplative prayer happens when the Lord sovereignly encounters me. And so he may take me where I am in there praying, one thing I desire, one thing... And Matthew is just, he didn't, he just, the Lord just started visiting his, his, his heart and started ministering to him. And Matthew just, it's like you can't even, to, to try to pray or to speak words is actually more work after that because that loving awareness of God has come upon you. Um, so it's less of a prayer in the sense of I'm communicating to God in more of a prayerful state, would you say? Yes, like absolutely. Maybe like the way some would interpret Revelation 1, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Right, right. And so meditative prayer is going to be very active. Contemplation is going to be very passive. Okay. In active meditative prayer, using my thoughts, using my words, in contemplation, I am, and, and the way that a lot of these contemplatives talk about it throughout history is infused prayer, mm-hmm. where God, his Holy Spirit is coming. It's that Romans 8, when we don't know how to pray, the, the Holy Spirit prays through us. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's even, it's, it's the reason, and, and they talk about this, folks, that forgive me if you're having trouble connecting with this. Teresa and John talk, Teresa especially, says, I'm, I'm doing my best to describe these experiences and those that have had them may be able to connect, but those that, that have not, it's, it's one grace to have these experiences, another grace to understand them, and another grace to be able to communicate them. Yeah. So, Lord, so, give me grace. You know? if, I, if I want to push back, because again, I, yes. I would say that all these experiences that, that you've explained, I've had similar mm-hmm. experiences. So I'm going to say you know, valid, but why place them in the category of prayer? Um, isn't, isn't prayer... You know, uh, uh, we, we're instructed on how to pray, right? right? The Bible tells us what, to, how to pray. But if this is an encounter of God encountering us, are, do do we do an error or disservice to de- title it prayer? Uh, because in doing so, um, are we are we are we violating the commands on how to pray? If this is something that's going to happen to us, uh, can't we call it a subsequent uh, experience or uh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him or so forth and so on? Uh, right. Wh- why use the term contemplative prayer? Right. That's a great question. And that's just across the board used throughout these contemplatives throughout church history. 
So what, because prayer for them is communion with God. Okay. That can involve vocal prayer. It can involve a crying out to God. My heart and my flesh cry out to you, O God. <laughs> I yell sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. My, my sound guy at church, my, say, watch, whoever's watch in the, the sound volume, booth buddy. at church, I mean, I just, it just comes out. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you, crew, over there for adjusting me. But um, <laughs> and so there's Bible breaking there's, out over here. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, just and, and you prayer without words is just you just it's words are essential to to the heart of prayer of communication with God, or else you wouldn't have the Psalms, you wouldn't have the, all the prayers mm-hmm. in the Bible. But a type of if prayer is more broadly understood, is this is a communion with the Lord, a deep inner heart communion with God. It's the be still and know that I am God type of prayer. It's that there was silence in heaven for half an hour, Revelation chapter 8 type of prayer. It's the Peter, James, and John are beholding the transfigured Christ and are out of their minds figure, trying to figure out what to do. And even the words they can come up with are complete nonsense. I mean, that's something is happening to them. And so in our charismatic uh, environment, the word encounter is typically what's more used. But it's but where I think it can be called prayer is because your spirit is still communicating with God's spirit. Mm-hmm. But there's in our part, usually in contemplative prayer, usually it's it's silence and it's receiving right. from the Lord. And it's him communicating to us. Right. Yeah, and, and I might jump in on that too, because I, I do kind of I don't know. I may be splitting. I'm in the middle, so <laughs> um, quite literally. But uh, to to maybe give a defense to it um, and that wording for it, Ephesians six, where it talks about to it, the command is to pray in the spirit. Right. And there's a little bit of debate over what that exactly means. Right. But um, I know that in my own prayer life, there are times when I'm like. I got the discipline, got the prayer list. I'm going to read these names off to God. Like, you know, Santa Claus has his, like, you know, I got like my list of toys and, you know, um, and I, that I'm asking for. And so, uh, and I just read my list off to God. But like, there are times when I do that and it's just sheer routine and it's, it's not really that great. There are times when, as I'm coming across those names on the prayer list, it's this mixture. I'm in this spiritual state of, listening for what that right. person actually needs in this moment right. and praying for it. And and it's like when I enter into, it's like a prayerful state, for lack of a better word, right. where it is this deep communion of talking and listening and being still. And uh, I found those prayers much more productive and uh, and effective. I mean, one story on that that I that I think is a just a good illustration of praying in the spirit. I have a I have a friend whose name is Keith and uh, he was with his family just like on the front porch one night late it was like 8 p.m. or something. They were just kind of they, they're like friends with all their neighbors and they're just kind of always out in their front yard and on their porch and that kind of thing. And uh, and he felt like they were just supposed to pray for people who were isolated. Hmm. And it's just like they, they were kind of like praying and talking, but they were just kind of in this prayerful state, and he felt like, we're supposed to pray for people who are isolated. And he says that like 45 minutes later, this guy's walking by who just like looks haggard and just homeless, and and he's just like, hey, man, how are you doing? Well, they enter into conversation, come to find out this was this guy's first time out of his house in wow. like more than a decade. Like, I don't know who'd been caring for him. I don't know the whole backstory, but it was like... And I want to say it was well over a decade. It was a long time, and he'd just been like this shut-in that just hadn't come out until that moment. And before it was Corona just, had made it cool. Yeah, before Corona made it cool. But anyway, yeah. I've that that prayerful state, right? And I think kind of in a more practical experience here too with with my wife, I can communicate directly to her with words. But there's there's moments I I see my wife and I just I just stop and I'm just looking at her. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I don't have words Mm -hmm. and it's, and it's like something catches me and I don't even know what it is that catches me about her. Mm -hmm. And, and I just, I'll, I'll look at her, I'll look at her in the eyes or I'll look at her and she'll, she'll do this with me. She'll just, I'll just, I'll be getting ready for, for, to leave for work or for school. And I, I look over and she's just, she's just looking. I'm like, what are you doing? And she's just, I'm just Mm -hmm. watching you get ready. And it's like this. This awe or fascination hits one of us, mm-hmm. and there's still a 
there's still a communication going on there. I may, I mean, me, when I'm getting ready, I'm not thinking about it, but she's, she's been captivated by something or I've been captivated by something with her. And it's really similar in contemplation. You just, you, it's like you had this awareness of God that you don't know how it came or how you got there. I mean, you can position yourself for it through spending time in meditative prayer, giving space for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. So, so there is an active part of what you do to position yourself. You, so meditative prayer can lead to con- contemplative absolutely, absolutely. prayer. Absolutely, yes. But these kinds of contempl- contemplation can come when you're not wanting it to or meaning it to. It can happen when you're washing the dishes. Uh-huh. I was with, before my wife and I got married, one, um, we were spending time together and we were talking. And the Lord just for lack of better words, just caught up my spirit. I mean, I was there. I was, um, but I, I, I actually, I couldn't speak and it kind of worried her. She's like, what are you, are you okay, Matthew? You're okay. And I was just frozen. And this, this awe of God and this presence of God just came over me. And I was, I was like frozen and I wasn't trying to cultivate this experience. Now my desire for God and my time outside of that moment in cultivating a prayer life helps position for those other things. But contemplation can come while you're actively meditating or it could come at any point in the day. So it, it is, in fact, the, uh, the the scripture that you used, Ephesians chapter 3. Um, uh, I'm trying to start, uh, because, you know, when you do a scripture verse, it's like your ABCs, you right. got to start in the middle. With power. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, strength with power through his spirit and your inner being, that being rooted and grounded in faith, you may have strength to comprehend together with all the saints, the breadth, length, depth, height, and to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. Exactly. So there's this collective knowledge that we have of propositional truths that we put precept upon precept of our right. knowledge of who God is. Absolutely. We say, um, you know, God is, he is just, he is love, he is these, and, and actually with the community of faith, I think the way that, that, that Paul is articulating it is that the community of faith helps us in that. Like like this testimony, this experience, um, your understanding of Scripture here, the, why, the way the body builds itself, other, itself up is actually showing the breadth, length, and the measurable portions of God's love, of God's, of right. God's goodness. And then there's this extra portion uh, uh, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Yes. Um, and so there's a knowledge that is c- of God's love that's Con- that's uh, I would say contemplative. It's 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 propositional, and there's mm-hmm. this non-propositional like almost the way that I experience it. I can only explain as ecstasy kind of experience Absolutely. of know God. this love that surpasses knowledge. And then right. he, he finishes it with saying, "And to him who can do exceedingly like y- you don't think that this is gonna happen." Like you, you like he is expecting the objectors that are listening to the letter, the fullness of God, really. And he's like. And to him who can do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you can ask, he can do like this. he's like he knew he can do this. This seems ridiculous. He can to do you. this for the person that says I suck at prayer. Yeah, he can do this for the person that says I don't have time to pray. He can do this for the person that says I don't know how to pray. Mm-hmm. And Paul, if you, just the words he uses in Ephesians three sixteen, I pray. So he's using his words. Yeah, that the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ from every family on heaven and earth has derived his name, which strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit. So it takes a strengthening of power in your Holy Spirit, in your inner man, for Christ, that Christ would dwell in your heart through faith, rooted and grounded in love, able to comprehend the width, length, depth, and height with all the saints, um, the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Mm-hmm. And so we've got a lot of terms going on here. I pray that you may know and that you may know his love in a way that surpasses knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is available to every single Christian. Um, Mm -hmm. As far as what is this going to look like, what I I mean is available is knowing the love of Christ, Mm -hmm. knowing the width, length, depth, and height, and being filled up with the fullness of God. Those things are available to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I think of in that that scripture is how— it's actually Paul praying this for the Ephesian church. Absolutely. And and so part of your experience has come through the fact that you learned so much from Tracy Eckert and from others as part of this praying community, which also fits into the prayer that you may together with all the saints right. know this love that surpasses all knowledge. Anyway, so um, you've been in this environment of prayer mm-hmm. that has helped foster Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Uh, and, and that's part of your influence. 
But then you've also, I feel like we should jump into another part of your influence that's less environmental and more from your personal study. Mm-hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit more about the influence of uh, St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross? Absolutely. So, like I said, I stumbled across these, uh, these two <laughs> in my journey to figure out what was going on and how can I have more of God? That was really my question. How can I have more of Jesus? And so uh, Teresa and John, just a little bit about them. They're 16th century folks. They are, um, they uh, were in the Carmelite order within the Roman Catholic Church in Spain. And in that time, you had, of Hosted course... the Hershey order. No, sorry. Keep going. I, I just, oh, I get yeah, it. Yeah, Carmelite. Yeah, yeah, Hershey. Yeah, yeah, sorry, okay. <laughs> um, so it's 16th century. And as you know, I mean, the Protestant Reformation is happening in that time. But even within the Roman Catholic Church, prior to the Protestant Reformation, you had reform voices and reform movements going on. Mm -hmm. Some of those reformers and reform movements uh, stayed within the Roman Catholic Communion and often happened in a monastic um, setting. Um, And then, of course, those that separated, whether willingly or unwillingly. I mean, you've got Calvin and Zwingli, who very intentionally separated from the Catholic Church for reform. You've got Martin Luther, who was excommunicated and so kind of de facto had to um, start a new communion, um, or decided to. But um, Teresa and John remained in the Catholic Church in Spain. Catholicism is very strong in Spain. But also within those reform movements, you also had a lot of these contemplative, illuminationist movements that really concerned both Catholics and Protestants at the time Mm -hmm. because of some of the extremes that they were seeing. Um, So you had folks claiming to have these kinds of experiences and it was distancing them from the church community. And I don't need the church. I don't need teaching. I don't need theology or accountability because I have direct access to God here. We've heard of that before. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. okay, okay. That really worried the church. And so John and Teresa, they start having these kind of experiences and start writing about them. They were under the close eye of the Spanish Inquisition. Their works were carefully reviewed. People were sent to question them once in a while. Poor John, uh, this is more of a politi- church politics thing, but ends up getting thrown into a monastery prison by some of his own Carmelite monastery. brothers for nine months and just in a room where there's nothing but a three-inch light coming from outside, and he's just in this three-by-ten room, probably about the size of the studio, if not smaller. He had to for, exercise for quite a bit of meditative prayer. Yeah, exactly, position. exactly. So he wrote The Dark Night of the Soul and <laughs> uh, <laughs> during that, the poem no during that deal. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so these guys, um, these are, and they're pulling from an earlier tradition. They were readers of St. Augustine. Um, they, Teresa of Avila loved Augustine's Confessions. And you read her autobiography, it's, you see that especially the beginning is styled very similarly. And she's very vulnerable in her struggles currently and past um, and in her life. And so, um, but within also, um, so I started reading them and started seeing how are they talking about contemplative prayer? How are they talking about meditation? And so I started, what was most beneficial to me was to see, first of all, there's someone that has some language for these experiences and knows how to use them profitably. Um, and so with them, what helped me so much was seeing here's here's not only the language for it, here's ways you can cultivate deeper intimacy with Jesus, and here are some pitfalls to beware of as you're on the journey. And what's really important to note for, for both John and Teresa um, is that contemplative prayer is but a means. The end goal for folks like Teresa and John is union with God, which simply for them is the uniting of the human spirit and the human will with God's spirit and God's will. It's where it's being, it's Paul's language of being conformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ in the highest degree possible in this life. And both would acknowledge that full, complete likeness of God happens after the resurrection but that we can progress to a state, for John especially, very close to what we can experience in the next life. Now, we still have a fallen human nature that gets tempted, but this uniting of the will to God is not just a a dry, hard, God, I don't feel like doing this, but I want to. 
but I, but I will because you say it's your word. That's part of the journey there. Mm -hmm. But what the transformation, this transformative union with God is for John is where your desires actually get changed, where you want to do the will of God, and these desires that Jesus calls these, these, these cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things that choke up the word. He says those actually start being reoriented into desires for the living God. Um, in a way that not only you desire it, but you're enacting those desires by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, that's the goal, and that's really important for them. And so as I started reading about this in them, it's the, they say the journey here to union with God, to being conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ, it does come through an active prayer life, of positioning yourself to receive this, con this contemplation, um, but it also takes a cultivation of humility. Mm -hmm. It takes a growth in the fruits of the Spirit. It takes uh, heeding sound doctrine and teaching, <laughs> and mm -hmm. it takes submission to a spiritual confessor, they called him, and to the church authority. Um, and so, of course, for them, that meant the Roman Catholic Church in mm -hmm. authority. Um, I'm a Protestant, and so that looks different for me. But um, for them, a spirit, a confessor was so important. They went to confession. They were confessing their sins to people. And mm -hmm. Teresa, she's having these experiences with these uh, spiritual directors and confessors. Most of them at the beginning thought she was faking it. But the Lord said, you need to tell them every experience you're having, and whatever they tell you to do, you need to do it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they told her, you need to stop trying to have these experiences. You need to stop trying to have visions. You need to stop praying in this way. And she actually did what they told her to do, but these experiences start happening even more. <laughs> and it wasn't until someone, again, 17 years later, comes in that had some awareness of what's going on here. Um, so I can talk about just what that process looks like for them theologically if you want to go there or if there's other questions you want to we address need first to, um, um, we've, we're already at like 9 15 9 16 so oh, wow yeah, yeah awesome. i know our intro is like so we, we can go we can go a little okay. bit late if, if you're okay. going a little bit late yeah, yeah. but um in in talking about that what are the dangers in looking at this as kind of like a secret knowledge of of how to pray? And I don't see this clearly in scripture. So we're going to some of these teachers in ancient history that have got uh, special. No I want to call it special knowledge or secret knowledge that's intentionally misleading, right? So maybe maybe poke a hole in that inflated question. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but it seems as if you're like, hey, there is an experience that all Christians should have. This experience we want you to have. And I'd be in the same zone. I'd be like, yes, I want you to have this. It's awesome. Right. Simultaneously, I'm on the other end going, I, I'm not a fan of like inducing these things or saying these are the practices that you should have, you should do to to have these experiences. Right. I'm not comfortable going that far either. Help me maybe bridge that gap before we, we talk about just, or maybe that will actually lead no, you into no. it really Let's well. No, no, let's do it. Let's yeah. do it. And so there are definitely some some pitfalls and some dangers to be aware of. And sure. again, it's, it's in terms of this, the goal is being conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. Right. And when that is not the goal, the dangers abound, okay? Mm -hmm. When a seeking of, of these supernatural experiences for the sake of the experiences mm -hmm. become the focus, you become prone in a very extreme way, John and Teresa would say, to deception, number one, mm -hmm. because the devil can counterfeit these experiences. No doubt. And John was a spiritual director, and he, he pastored a lot of people, and he... he I love reading him because he speaks of these experiences that he's having, this, this very poetic um, description of the love of God and these, these experiences, but he's also very careful. He's like, guys, if you're seeking after these things, you will get deceived. Um, and what people start, here are some signs that your focus is in the wrong way, uh, is, is, is in the wrong place. If you are, um, let's look at the fruit of these experiences. Are you getting more boastful and proud? Are you starting to accuse other people of not being as Christian as you are because they have not had these kinds of experiences? Are you starting to advertise these experiences as if uh, as, as in order to gain attention? Um, and John says this will actually hinder you from growing in union with God. If you are so attached to these experiences that you, that, that you say, God, if I never have another vision, encounter, trance, or anything like that, as long as I'm conform to the likeness of Jesus Christ, if you, if you can't arrive there, 
He says, you need some more purging. <laughs> it was those prayers that actually mm-hmm. got me there, if we're going to be honest. Absolutely. Like everyone was talking about all these experiences, and mm-hmm. it was those kinds of prayers that were like, Lord, I don't want those things to be a distraction. I'm not right. going to pursue those things. Whatever you want to give me is sufficient for me. Right. Uh, I, and it was those kinds of prayers that were like... Absolutely. And Teresa herself said, she said, I didn't yeah. pray for these types of experiences. I prayed that God would forgive my sins and give me grace not to offend him. Hmm. I, I like the way you you talk about it. It really comes down to what your focus is. Absolutely. And if your focus is union with God, that that really helps. Because I, I was concerned about some of the same stuff. It, so, it sounded a little bit like that. We come back to this a lot with that Gnostic mm-hmm. tendency of, right. of special secret knowledge and special experiences and and asceticism, you know? Um, and if, if I understand right, even St. John of the Cross, and part of it's just kind of like monastic culture of the day, mm-hmm. you know, the self-flagellation and all of very, that kind of stuff. Very austere. Is very it is. prolific. And it, it worried Teresa. Teresa. So she warned him against she it. She warned him against it. She good. said, so I, and he regretted it later in life. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. good. But, you know, I come back to, I think of Philippians 3.1, uh, where Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. It's a safeguard for you. And then he says, watch out for those, uh, basically the, the Pharisees, but those mutilators of the, fle- of the flesh, the Judaizers. Right, right. And, uh, and so he connects together these two ideas, like what is our safeguard from religion against pursuing, uh, pursuing God in our own good works and in our flesh and not really pursuing God, but basically... Uh, our, our own self-fulfillment through religion. He's, the, the safeguard is rejoice in Jesus, not my goodness. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I think, like, just to your point, I'll let me finish the question, but, like, the, to that point, there there's two churches everywhere. There's Ephesus and there's Corinth, and, and shades of gray in between. You've got Ephesus, who does everything right, doctrine, precept upon precept, but there's no zeal, love, or adoration, and right. they get judged for it. Or you've got Forsaken Corinth, your first who's love. all about the gifts, but they can't seem to get order to save their life, Absolutely. right? Mm-hmm. And we see that in different shades, where it's like, hey, I love this experience, this is awesome, but we don't have any kind of structural order, whether that be with sin or doctrine or those kinds of things. And that seems to be the tension of all churches everywhere, They're just mm-hmm. trying to hit the radical middle of passionately pursuing uh, supernatural, uh, passionately pursuing the Lord, um, and 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 while while doing that, staying rooted and grounded yeah, in Scripture. Absolutely. absolutely. But, but but finishing your question. Sorry. Yeah. Well. Uh, so one, I'm ag- I'm agreeing with you, and I'm thankful that you said that because, and I'm thankful that you asked that about the secret knowledge and the, and I think touching on the asceticism too. Uh, uh, we do need that safeguard of this is about communion with God. Yeah, absolutely. Joy in Him. But I want to come up with uh, or bring up another danger, and that is, um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in um, contemplative prayer about sort of detachment, and that mm-hmm. language sounds right. all, like the idea of losing myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm I can get a little uncomfortable with that. It feels a little bit like you know, like the way Hindus and Buddhists talk about meditation or New Age. This sort of like instead of entering into the presence of God, fully present also myself, to where even if we, as we are becoming one, we do maintain our otherness, right? right absolutely. I don't, I don't want to be a drop in the ocean of Brahman, right? Like, uh, no, 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 yeah. <laughs> what yeah. a love place yeah. quote. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, um, so help us out. How is this different from New Age and Eastern mysticism? I feel like our guest last Monday would be like, "Stop talking, Matthew. This is terrible." This you know, would be great this is love to have a, a I, love I, wish I, could, I wish I could put you both on the show at the same. We need to do that at some <laughs> I'm, point. I'm sure I'm going to sit in Fight. this video. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens. No, no. I actually I, I watched uh, Steven Steven Steven's videos, and I think they were really important to call the body of Christ to. What is our focus here? Mm-hmm. Is our focus on this? Uh, what did he call it? This uh, basically unholy idol- fascination. Unholy fascination. This idolatry yeah. of the supernatural. Yeah. Um, John of the Cross calls it spiritual gluttony, mm-hmm. where people get on this thing of I'm gonna go. I'm and I, I I use this language. I believe in this language, but I'm I'm gonna talk more about how it's used. I'm gonna go in the spirit, and I'm gonna go into this into this certain realm, and I'm gonna encounter this whole specific host here and have a conversation with them and do something in the spirit and then bring it down. I mean, it 
It gets pretty wild. Wait, time out. Um, Did you say that you're a fan of that language? No. Okay. No, I'm, I'm okay. a fan of being in the spirit. Gotcha. Like, okay, but I'm five. not a fan. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I was about to go, uh, okay, no, no, well, no, no, as no. for me and my yeah. house. Uh, no, no, no keep, go ahead. This stuff keep going. Can, <laughs> This stuff can go off the rails. I had a yeah. buddy that was at a conference one time where there was a, a huge focus on the on the supernatural and on going in the spirit. Gotcha. And the folks started talking about an encounter they supposedly had were with the demon Medusa. Mm-hmm. And they were told to, they saw Medusa weeping, and they were told by the Lord to baptize Medusa and to redeem her. And so they start going to this teaching about redeeming demons. And my buddy, he he's like, I walked out, like, and I'm not associated with this uh, movement anymore. I, I um, would have had a more of a so, not a Zwinglian approach, but a Lutheran. Like, you're gonna have to remove me. I'm probably exa- standing up and shouting. In that, oh in man, that sermon. it's just in. And Colossians warns about this. Yeah, um, those that get all caught up in some vision they had in the worship of angels. Yes, you know, and yeah, and yeah. this and they've this, been detached from the head. Exactly, and this is a a human religion. What does he say that is? A self-based religion Which, or a debased uh-huh. religion that is of no use Has in the conquering the desires wisdom. of the flesh. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, and so anyway, ahead. but how's it different from the New Age? The main thing is the object of contemplation. Um, in the New Age, the object is is an impersonal whatever force, Brahman, um, or a pagan deity. Mm-hmm. In Christianity, in Christocentric, Christ-centered contemplation, Jesus is the object, and union with a very deeply personal God is the object. And so when it comes to phrases like detachment, I mean, that's very common in these guys. Um, detachment basically means poverty of spirit. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it is a letting go of the desires of the flesh. Mm-hmm. And what my mind, will, emotions are maybe being naturally drawn to, they use the term mortification. I'm going to put to death, and Paul talks about this Romans 6, 7, 8, if you put to death the, the, the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit, you will have life. Mm-hmm. Okay? The mindset on the Spirit, on, on the flesh is death, the one spit, set on the Spirit is life and peace. And mm-hmm. so, but there is a empowering of the Holy Spirit where through the grace of God, you say no to ungodliness. And that's mm-hmm. really what detachment is. But detachment in a, in a broader sense is even things that may not be overtly sinful, mm-hmm. that Jesus is saying, putting his, his finger on saying, hey, I know you enjoy doing this, but it's really hindering your relationship with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so too okay. much Netflix. Too much Netflix. It's <laughs> not, not necessarily Absolutely. sinful, but it's not necessarily fruitful either. Exactly, right. exactly. Gotcha. It's, okay, well, so maybe let's, let's dive into that. So it's not, it's not just removing idolatry from the heart. Right, so that's called like, Christian living. That's called <laughs> Christianity, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I think about, uh, I guess one thing that makes me a little uncomfortable mm-hmm. is it seems to emphasize spiritual, 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 and almost to the point uh, I when I read it, it almost sounds like matter is bad. Okay, which explains why there was maybe a tendency toward asceticism, mm-hmm. but it's like. You know, forget everything physical and just focus everything on the spiritual so that your spirit and God's spirit are one. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it's good. I want to be one with God's spirit in my spirit. Right. But I mean, even in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it's, it, it speaks of, or 1 Thessalonians 5, it talks about a sanctification of body, soul, and spirit. Absolutely. 1 Corinthians 7, removing the defilement of body and soul, and so or spirit, I can't remember which. But um, anyway, it, it's an entering in of the total person, not just my my spirit. So can you speak into that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, definitely. And and I'll be, I'll be very honest in reading contemplatives, even reading Teresa and John, reading through the tradition of the Church, there's some of it that is a little hard to swallow. Um, and it's usually related to that very topic, um, or to this 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 uh, another one we can get into or later. Luther but uh, or Calvin for that matter, right? Right. They had it's, a different context, right? And so this um, this kind of language, it I've I've had to wrestle through this, mm-hmm. and I still don't know that I'm fully on board with everything I come across in literature like this. Mm-hmm. I took a class on medieval mysticism last and I thought I was going to love it. I was like, man, this is going to be great. Going to read all these <laughs> mystics that that uh that and and by mystics it's just contemplatives like Teresa and John. 
But I started reading some of their stuff. I'm like, some of this stuff is really weird, you know. <laughs> but um, what I love about Teresa and John is they're in a, it, and John is theologically trained. Mm-hmm. Um, and he is training people theologically and in sound doctrine. Um, so that hasn't spoken to your question at all. So I'm going to go to your question there. How does this, it seems to be this matter is bad, dualism. focus only on the spirit. I think sometimes it can seem like that and sound like that. Um, now, with John specifically, this is going to sound odd for us Protestants, but he has to deal with this being a Roman Catholic where images and icons are very common in their worship. And he's um, he starts telling people that even these things, even though the church has given us these specific images to use in prayer, if we're too attached to these things mm-hmm. and we're more focused on the actual statue or the image of Jesus rather than the person that it's representing, and I've got my own little collection of Jesus statues or statues of Savior, mm-hmm. but I'm not actually engaging the Lord, like mm-hmm. then we're misusing these things. Um, and so that's kind of with him where I start seeing the physical is important to John insofar as it causes your spirit to become aware of God. Mm-hmm. Um, now, of course, he was very austere in his asceticism, which Teresa was very worried about. Um, and so I think there were some things going on there. Um, now, um, what I think the scripture is clear about is that when we eat food, we eat it in faith and with joy and thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. And that, um, that we're in a physical contact with people, mm-hmm. that we're enjoying fellowship of the Holy Spirit together, and the, and the physical interaction that I'm having with people is very important. Mm-hmm. Um, when contemplative prayer starts taking people and isolating them completely out of community, mm-hmm. out of corporate worship, out of submission to spiritual authority, Mm-hmm. Um, and even just enjoying certain natural things that God has given us, those are those are times to be concerned. Teresa loved going out into nature and being with the Lord. Um, mm-hmm. And she just, I just look at it. She's like, I wasn't really good at meditation. All these meditative techniques that all these people are talking about, I was never good at them. I go into a park, I imagine Jesus in front of me, or I start reading a book, and the Lord starts to meet me. Mm-hmm. And so she was very. In that sense, I see for her, there was a deep connection there. At the same time, some of her language is, I'm a miserable worm, I'm not worth anything. And Mm -hmm. so you see that very common. And some of that was the monastic piety Mm -hmm. of humility. And so I think some of that is heart doesn't sit as well with me. Mm -hmm. Um, And so how how do we appropriate that in a very biblical, scriptural way? I want to, God has created things and he's made them good. Mm-hmm. And so um, I've actually, this is going to sound really weird and maybe weird you out even more, but hey. I was eating some tiramisu that my friend made one time. Okay. So weird. I and say, I we've, started, we've, we've, we've and it, weird I don't even really like tiramisu, but I started eating it and I started experiencing the presence of the Lord. Uh-huh. And I was yeah. like, <laughs> hey, I had an aged steak before. I swear I saw God. And I mean, it's like my friend Francoise, if you're watching, she that was the best tiramisu I've ever had. And I had, and I was like, oh my land. I'm like, Dude, that doesn't the sound weird right at all to me. No, okay. I love it because I feel like too much of Christianity is all like, hey, it's all spiritual and anything sensory is bad and i'm like god made the senses actually matter yeah, is good so this absolutely. is back to your point um or to, to your question it sounds as if i try to repeat back what you're saying is areas that would anchor us and one that maybe you didn't mention um was that meditative prayer anchors us um in reality where contemplative prayer is, so the the meditative prayer is that the breadth length depth and height and the contemplative prayer is surpasses knowledge. It's mm-hmm. the both and. It's actually what keeps them both together. It, it, would would you say that just regular prayer, if if not if not engaging contemplative prayer, is in fact not it, it, meditative prayer? Is in fact dualism in a sense that only the material matters. That only the way that we can construct our prayers is all right, that matters. Right, right, right. It seems as if Teresa of Avila, um, she. Uh, I apologize if I'm destroying no, her name. Okay, okay. Um, uh, she she does both. She says that 
our 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 prayers are not to be completely consumed with our thoughts towards God and are not to be completely mindless in a way uh, that God just speaks through us. There's some somehow this tension of ebb and flow of both of those things. Is right. That correct? Right. You have some in these contemplative traditions that will start to set aside meditative prayer completely, mm. and will say you have to get to this place of pure contemplation. John seems like he says that in certain places, but then he comes back around in other places. Teresa is very. Ex- very explicit on this. She says, you know, some people say you got to get rid of all of this like meditative techniques, but she says, for me, I'm 75 and it still helps me, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. And so she's real funny about it and real, real candid. Um, and what's really key too is that participation in that sacramental life of the church. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm going in, I am, they, they would hear the word preached. John started multiple seminaries where he was training people theologically for these monasteries, they started, Teresa started like 14 monasteries, and John would start these colleges to train them theologically, get them grounded in the Word, and then go and teach people like Teresa and her nuns theology and sound doctrine and give them sermons on an expository preaching. Um, that was a key element of a lot of the experiences that Teresa describes was while she was um, participating in the Lord's Supper in a communion, mm-hmm. uh, community environment. Um, so the community was absolutely key. And then a a spiritual director, a confessor. Hmm. That's um, good. And so for me, for me, I was like, John and Tracy Eckert, I didn't know what to do with all this and how to pray. I would tell them these experiences I was having. I would ask them, how do I grow in this? But it's it's not contemplative prayer. The contemplative life is not just about these experiences. It's about growing in the likeness of Christ. And so some of it, how do I grow in prayer do I meditate this way or that way? Some of it is you need to let go of that sin or that disordered attachment Mm -hmm. to something that God's saying, I really need you to let go of this. Mm -hmm. If you will do that, you will actually grow closer to Jesus and grow in prayer. Mm -hmm. So how does this relate to like soaking? And we we talked Mm -hmm. about this in our show with Stephen. This sounds kind of like... Um, you know, we, we talked about kind of emptying of yourself that seems to be a kind of pattern that, that is encouraged. Mm-hmm. What, what are your thoughts about soaking prayer and how this maybe correlates with that? Right, right, right. Soaking prayer, I think, is is a way to experience the Lord. And that I think people legit, I've, I've had a number of sweet moments Could with the Lord. Could you define soaking prayer for Soaking us? prayer, you're just, you're, you're putting on worship, and it could be mainly instrumental or more kind of less words involved, more drawn, and you are sitting down, hands open, and just not attempting to pray very much, and just, I'm here to receive from the Lord. Um, That's how I understand soaking. You know, that doesn't seem to mm be... And that doesn't seem to be compl- contemplative or meditative, because meditative seems to be consume my thoughts, contemplative, something that the Lord does to you. Soaking, what you just described, seems to be, I'm going to position myself for... Well, I mean, ultimately nothing is what it sounded like, but um, like if I'm listening to instrumental music and I'm going to empty my mind, like I don't know what's going to happen to you. Right, right. Uh, and the goal, here's a, we, we hear about it. Here's what I think is healthy soaking, okay. if I can put it that way. <laughs> healthy a healthy soaking. way to soak. <laughs> a good soak. You know? Yeah, Epsom salt. A, a good, get, good get Epsom, salt, Epsom salt, lavender. <laughs> nice glass of grape juice. Exactly, yeah. A great way to soak is as you're putting on Christian music. Mm-hmm. Um, and it can be instrumental, it can have words, um, but your focus is on God, okay? Mm -hmm. And so you are, um, and if it helps you to meditate on a passage of Scripture, if it helps you to go through Revelation chapter 4 and what John's experiencing there and start to represent those images into your mind, it's it's a quieting of your soul to say, God, I'm going to meditate, but my goal is to meet with you. My goal is to focus my thoughts and attention on you. So it's not an emptying of the self in the sense of I totally... It's a waiting on the Lord. It's a waiting on the Lord, okay. exactly. There's biblical it's language beholding, I'm It's beholding, it's gazing. It's a removal it's of distractions. Removal of distractions. Which it's we the, could use in our society. It's Mary of Bethany sitting at Jesus' feet and hearing his word. Yeah. Okay, Jesus, I'm sitting here, and I'm ready for you to speak to me. Okay, okay. now um, respond to this. So. Okay. I'm imagining somebody saying, well, uh, Matthew, I believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, and I mean, the Scripture talks about meditation, the Scripture talks about prayer, um, but I I don't really f- see the need for 
contemplative prayer. I mean, of course, those words aren't in the scripture, but like if if it's something that happens to me, right? Why do we need to emphasize it? If I'm just praying and seeking and meditating, doing all the sort of process things that you talked about, pray, seek, meditate, worship, eliminate distractions. If I'm doing all of those things, why even talk about contemplative prayer? Because it either happens or it doesn't. I have no control over it outside right. of I just do what the Bible says, which is pray. Right. Well, great question. Again, the goal is not to be a contemplative. The goal is to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, and so that's 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 got to be the focus the whole time. Now, part of what these folks are talking about is part of the way that God molds you into his likeness and conforms your will to his will is that he will infuse you with his presence and with revelation of who he is and his desires and his nature that are not out incompatible with Scripture. In fact, it may be a truth of Scripture mm-hmm. that Jesus is supernaturally infusing deeply into your soul where your desire starts to get transformed to actually fulfill that commandment in a way that is beyond the, well, the Bible says it, I'm going to do it. Yes, do that. I mean, John and Teresa would both say, do it whether you feel like it or not. But transformation happens when the Lord supernaturally comes to you, and as you're praying or meditating, and it can be real subtle. It doesn't have to be a day, an hour-long thing. So some of those most subtle experiences of the presence of God are what start tenderizing our heart. Mm-hmm. And that's, that is what's absolutely key here, is I want to position myself in God. I want whatever is going to make my heart tender to you in love to know the width, length, depth, and height of the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. Is When, that's, when the, the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge and the fullness of God is the focus and the goal, you may or may not go into these big, wild encounters. Some of you will. And what Teresa and John are here is to say, I'm here to help you in case this happens. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to help you say, don't get fixated on these things. Mm -hmm. Enjoy them, receive them from the Lord. But if these are not cultivating humility, love, love of God, love of neighbor, then something's wrong here. So. Well, we need we need to wrap up. Uh, but but for the the sake of what you just said, I think you can actually respond to that with scripture and saying mm-hmm. just are rearticulating what what your interpret your interpretation of what they're saying uh, in scripture. We see this right. Hey, there's a spiritual gift. Don't despise the spiritual gift. Right. Uh, value the spiritual gift. Be thankful for the spiritual gift. But there's right. a better way, and it's love. Yeah. Right. So don't be fascinated or obsessed, and and create the haves and have nots and distinctions among yourselves. We're all parts of the body. Uh, we need each other. These experiences are valuable because they come from God, and the gifts of God build us up. So right. if this happens, if God gives you this gift, it's a good and precious thing. Let's maybe Absolutely. get some some closing thoughts okay. uh, for everyone. Kind of what are main takeaways that we want everyone to have walking away from this video before Definitely. we wrap things up and make sure to talk about your school as well um, uh, with the, the, that you guys are doing a, an internship with. Is it called an internship or is it a, is it like a school of ministry? We call it a school. Okay, yeah, excellent. sometimes okay. We used to call it internships. A lot of folks would call it that, but it's excellent. a school. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. Um, uh, Michael, let's go ahead and start. What, what are some, some closing thoughts for you as far as contemplative prayer? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, a verse that's coming to mind for me is Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, that says, when you go into the house of God, go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Right. God is in heaven, therefore let your, and you're on earth, so let your words be few. And, it, and I think uh, that speaks to what contemplative prayer, I think, is about, is it's about entering into the presence of God and coming to meet with God. And so I, I think before I'd ever looked at or studied contemplative prayer at all, uh, my perception of it was, here's the seven-step process for achieving contemplative prayer. And honestly, that kind of turned me off, because I'm like, I don't need a seven-step process, I just need the gospel, that's mm-hmm. good for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but at least my understanding of it is that's that's not really what it is, that, mm-hmm. that Teresa and St. John and some of these others, they're trying to put vocabulary to some experiences yes. that are depicted in Scripture, right. but it's a not not about the one, two, three process. It is about union with God. It is right. about connecting with Him. 
And practically, I think for our listeners, what I would say is, is to let this be a challenge. What, to, to whatever degree you agree with Matthew's words or don't, uh, if you're a believer in Jesus, surely you would agree that drawing near to God is a good thing to do. Right. Yeah. And so I would say, make time to draw near to Him, not just like checking off the Bible reading or the prayer list, but actually for communion. And the example that you shared about just looking into your wife's eyes, you know, yeah. like there, there's different ways to connect with people. Sometimes it's talking, sometimes it's doing, a, you know, sharing a hobby, but to just commune with, yeah. to just commune with God. Make some time to just say, I'm just going to draw close to him right now and fix your mind on just being aware of him and listening and opening your spirit. So I think that would be my challenge. Excellent. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I think this is what this, what the call I think from the Lord is this Psalm 27 4. One thing I desire from the Lord, that thing I seek. I may gaze at the beauty of the Lord. I may dwell in his temple. I may, and so I'm just kind of paraphrasing there, but um, it's this Mary of Bethany sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing his words. Jesus went off to pray early in the morning and be alone with his Father. Um, this, this, Call to prayer is a call to solitude with God, but not at the expense of abandoning the community of faith, not at the expense of being rooted and grounded in the scriptures and meditating on his law day and night. Mm -hmm. These type of but what happens as you start to pursue the Lord and say, God, again, you don't go to the Lord and say, God, I want to be, I want contemplative prayer. You go to God, I want to be conformed to the image of your son. I want the fullness of God, because you said this is available to me. Show me how to become one with you. Show me how to grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Um, so my my heart, just closing thoughts there, is just pursue Jesus. Make Jesus the focus. Make growing in his image and likeness the focus. Stay in the community of faith. Stay in accountability. As these experiences, maybe some of you have them. Um, you know, we could do a whole nother session um, on just these types of experiences in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, but um, again, the focus is on the Lord. So um, our, uh, our Encounter Jesus School this summer, uh, the reason that we started this thing back in 2010 was to teach people to pray. Uh, we, we engage different types of prayer here unto causing you or helping you start to look more like Jesus. Um, so we go through some of these things. Um, we go through the Song of Songs. We go through the Father Heart of God. We go through... Um, learning how to engage in intercessory prayer and things like that. Um, so I hope you'll check that out, storehousedallas.com slash EJS. Excellent. Well, thank you, Matthew, for coming on and dialoguing with us again about uh, this uh, this topic. Uh, for those of you who are watching, I, I guess my major takeaway is if you're a regular watcher of Remnant Radio, you're probably inclined to be interested in the theological precepts. You're probably more Ephesus than you are Corinth by nature, okay? Um, and because of that, this is an area that we need to stretch ourselves in. So, so if you are a regular subscriber, this is my challenge to you. If you're not a regular subscriber, subscribe. Uh, if you like this video, hit like. If you did disliked it, hit the dislike button twice. Um, and, and the idea here is that we need to stretch ourselves in areas, right? Um, saying that I have a gift for teaching doesn't give me an excuse to neglect earnestly designing prophecy, right? Uh, to being prophetically minded doesn't give you the excuse um, to, to not be ready in season and out of season to give an account for your faith. So, so what we need to do as Christians is we need to make sure that we love the Lord God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. We need to be able to, to rightly uh, apply this to our lives. So if you're, if you're out there and you're saying, hey, maybe I'm uncomfortable with the way that things are being said. Maybe I'm uncomfortable with some of the language that's being used here. The ultimate petition here is to say, let's pursue God with our mind and our heart because these things aren't in opposition to each other. So those are kind of my closing thoughts. Uh, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, every Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, we have a show. I'm sorry I didn't get to a lot of questions today. I saw a couple of them in there, uh, questions about Catholicism. Some, my Anglican brothers are all up in there. We, we got a couple of Anglican bishops on, and then the Anglicans live on this channel, and I love it, man. I love the <laughs> diversity. Uh, guys, leave a comment in here. What are your thoughts about contemplative prayer? Uh, uh, is it something that you want to encounter? Is it something that you might put on the shelf? It's something you got some questions about? Drop it in here because if we do a part two, we'd love to ask or answer those questions. Be blessed and we'll see subscribe. you Subscribe. Yeah, subscribe. Peace.